Okay, folks, we're going to talk about some important topics here before we close out for the day. Um, things you guys need to know as you're going into the final exam. And, of course, I'm not getting the screen up the way I want it. My, my second display is messing me up here, so I'm going to exit presentation mode and just go with the straight PowerPoint here up on the screen. All right. Um, these are the, the topics for this PowerPoint. The materials that I'm pulling from are from your beginning ASP MVC book from Chapter 8, predominantly, along with some other sources. Um, so that material is stuff you want to look at. The truth is, you've been using this stuff already and probably not giving it much of a second thought. And really, what, what's happening is you're mixing a whole bunch of languages, right? You're using HTML, your CSS, and regular JavaScript, obviously. You know you're throwing in C-sharp code. You know you're, you're throwing in Razor code to do the views. But really, you also have jQuery in the mix. You're also throwing in Ajax. And then you're going to be introduced to this other approach that can augment uh, MVC applications called Web API. And that's something we did talk about already in Web 2 very briefly uh, in conjunction with uh, RESTful uh, development approaches. So my intent here isn't to like demonstrate anything, it's to talk about these in, in concepts so that you know the key things to study as you're going into the final and so that hopefully you're understanding what you're doing with the applications you're building a little bit more clearly and why you're using these tools. All right. It will become available. I have not posted it yet. You want me to post it right away? Okay. I'm going to pause and post. Okay. So just for point of reference, I did add that PowerPoint to the course shell. So it's in section four near the top right here. You just click download and follow along. Um, the other thing that you should know is that I've provided a link here which takes you to some resources that Saad developed for us last summer. You guys should explore those as well. It has information on a lot of information on JSON and Ajax and some links to some really helpful things. Um, some of that you should take the time to, to look through real carefully. Okay, back to the, the PowerPoint here. Now, we've already learned about jQuery. We learned about that in Web 2. And you probably learned about it when you were learning about JavaScript as well. But jQuery, it basically, is just a JavaScript library. It's a collection of pre-written uh, syntax constructs and uh, pre-written methods and functions that kind of simplify your life a little bit. It really leads to rapid development. Um, it originally was kind of put together uh, to allow for slick front-end um, animations and, and interface components without doing a lot of coding. And then it kind of evolved into doing just about everything that JavaScript can do. And there's many different libraries, many different versions that you can uh, grab. Um, it uh, can be used with so many different types of web applications. And you're, you see that with the code that you're writing, and I hope you recognize when you're looking at the code, when you see that dollar sign in front of a snippet of code, it indicates to you that you are using jQuery. Whenever you see any JavaScript statements that are preceded with a dollar sign. This stuff, like regular JavaScript, can be embedded into a regular HTML document within script tags, or it can be linked to externally, which is typically the, the fashion that we use. You can also intermingle it with other languages. So very often you're going to see it kind of dumped into you know, HTML and your programming languages. It, it gets pretty intense, the layers of encapsulation that can happen. Um, so you want to be mindful of that. You can see it works well with all these different technologies, some of which we're about to talk about, and that's why I have that there. Um, Ajax, or excuse me, jQuery can be applied to any um, DOM objects on an HTML page using CSS style selectors. You should already know that, and that includes all the, the pseudo selectors, extended selectors, you know, the ones that are all conditional, all those apply as well. The other thing that's kind of neat is that you can chain methods, and that's something maybe you haven't had a lot of experience with in JavaScript, but that's where um, you have one particular thing you're dealing with, and instead of like writing a statement that says, take this and move it, take this and do this with it, take this and do that with it, 
you can put it all in one statement that just says this thing do this do this do this do this and you can do them all in a row on one line of code it's just amazing how much power that actually gives you all right so part of the problem with JavaScript is how you write it and where you place it you guys have learned that the, really the, the best way to do things is to separate your JavaScript from your HTML documents um, for a lot of different reasons however there are times when you are writing code and this is this is the part that, that gets people is you're writing code that gets um, turned into HTML as a result of the code that you're writing and sometimes you get JavaScript that's brought into the mix on top of it all so um, they came up with this approach called unobtrusive JavaScript in jQuery and really what that means is it enforces the fact that you need to remove that from the, the, the view basically from the page that's going to be rendered to the client um, you know old school approaches as I indicate there um, it wasn't always very simple to reuse code especially stuff that got you know put in line right if you pull it out you can you can create functions and you can call those functions from anywhere uh, the other problem was that we would have a lot of inline event handlers and I think we saw that in web 2 quite a bit um, and why that's really not a very good idea and how jQuery is a lot more eloquent at handling those things um, the uh, unobtrusive benefits you know as listed there you know the thing that I like about it is basically you can take the code and once you have it written you can kind of use it just about anywhere and if you're smart about how you write it and if you write it generic enough it really can be quite portable so you come up with a way to do something really that's really slick in an application and you can just pick up that piece and take it somewhere else that's that's a huge part of it okay so what is Ajax well, AJAX as, uh, as an acronym is Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. It was originally designed to allow us to interface our web applications um, through JavaScript to be able to pull in information that was separate from the page. You know, we pull it in from the server and we can drop it onto the page with hypothetically not doing anything else with the page, leaving the page in place. We don't have to reload the page, just the portion that needs the information. And, and this is something you should have learned already, but just in case it didn't stick. Um, the, the thing that I have way at the bottom here is what we call flicker-free pages. In that first book that we were using here in class, they do have a, a chapter uh, towards the end, and I was originally going to sign it to you, and I, then I decided not to, uh, where they show you what a flicker-free page is, if you want to go through that chapter and, and, and try the approach but basically we will just basically create a region of the page that's going to receive the contents that are being pulled in and, and repopulated on the page now if you combine this with a number of different technologies which is really what's happening in the applications that you're doing is for example when you put something in the shopping cart in the MVC music store and it's there and you see it and then all of a sudden you go in there and you say well I don't want it here and you click delete or remove or whatever the button says and you see it kind of fade away but the page didn't change we just manipulated the DOM dynamically and removed it but if we were to pull stuff in that same fashion it's done using Ajax so we're not changing the rest of the page just the piece we need and it really it makes it behave like a standard uh, operating system native application that's kind of the point um, you know the the point of developing this I mean they wanted to use it with XML because XML was becoming kind of like the way to, to deliver database content back in the you know late 90s early 2000s um, but XML does have some inefficiencies one of the inefficiencies like you guys are working like with those web, web config files and you see like they'll have like connection strings and of course you have to have this really long tag that says connection string right if you have a really big XML file and you have a lot of tags, you're not even moving any of the data and you're moving all this data. You know, you're moving like descriptive components. So very quickly we started to move away from actually using straight up XML and what really has become the standard now is that we start uh, using JSON to move a lot of the same information, making it even faster. So 
Um, if you're looking at how AJAX works in the context of the standard jQuery, um, top left there, um, notice the little directive that you have. It's basically a method. There's no selector attached, just a dollar sign and then a dot. So it kind of makes it um, kind of anonymous in, in, in a sense. You know, we're not attaching it to a DOM object. We're just running AJAX. And it's pretty easy to look inside here and, and see that we're, we have some sort of a thing that we're applying a value to. And believe it or not, you know, I'm talking about JSON, and actually this information here is in the form of JSON right inside the jQuery request. So we're calling upon AJAX. We're using JSON to pass the information, and then we are able to, in this case, trigger an anonymous function and, and do something. But that's one of the ways that you can do it, using jQuery. When you start switching over to using either Web API or MVC, and you start to work with what we call helpers, right? And you guys have touched upon those too. You're going to see that we're using AJAX in a little bit different way. We're still calling it out, and you can see there's a little razor directive there that calls out AJAX, and then it runs a little action link method, and then you can probably just very simply see that there's the correlation between the two different approaches. It's just a different syntax in this environment. One of the things that you guys have been doing already, probably unknowingly, is that you are creating uh, forms using this approach. So you'll, you'll set up what looks like a lot of standard HTML, and then inside there you'll see, once again, these little razor directives that are pulling from these libraries. And um, in this case here, uh, where my cursor is right now, you can see that we're, we're putting in a using directive and we're throwing in a bunch of Ajax kind of inline brute force. And it helps the form to basically very efficiently render. Uh, of course, if you're doing something like that, you're going to return partial views, at least in this case doing a form, where we're not going to redraw the whole page. The page sits in place. The form is pulled up by Ajax. You fill it out. You hit the button. It might give you a little dialog box. But ultimately, all that work is happening without redrawing the page. Now, in terms of having a web page act like an application, which is really kind of our goal, that is ideal. Because we're saving all this data transmission, not redrawing the page. The stuff is changing in place. It gives the user a very rich experience. And it also allows for all the postbacks and callbacks that we're learning about as well. That data can go to and from the server without redrawing the page. We can make the requests using AJAX. Form-driven applications are natural for it. And given the fact that you're using jQuery, you're using AJAX to move the data, you also can control the user interface very eloquently. And that's why you always see these technologies working together. Uh, these are examples right from the book, so if you want to like kind of review them, you can go back and, and read in detail and try the examples. Um, word of caution, though, the examples in the book don't always work, especially in that beginning book. They're more for reading than trying, I've discovered. Um, but here they're kind of showing you the example that like you might be working on a form, and they might have this little link here. You click the link, and it brings the dog picture in without changing the page. It just makes it come up. And it's not that it was hidden and we're making it show. We're actually requesting it from the server and bringing it to the page. And then notice uh, here in the source for the image, I know that's hard to read, it's pretty small, but we actually have a razor directive which runs a view bag and pulls in the photo. So instead of putting in a finite URL, it's kind of doing it dynamically of sorts. All right. Uh, a little bit more of an example here with Ajax on the left-hand side is the kind of the generic form of the request, and on the right-hand side is a detailed example, once again from the book. Notice that this stuff is actually in line with HTML, and that's why you see script tags around the whole thing. And that's more for sake of example than anything else. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's how you should do it. Um, you see it's all jQuery code inside there, and the Ajax tag using... 
uh, basically a JSON style approach, key value pairs, is pulling all the information. Now the reason we use the JSON, and that's on the slides that are coming up, I believe, um, is because um, JSON is very, very efficient compared to XML. I don't need to put in a whole bunch of like overhead tags to move the information. Additionally, it really does not care what language it's working with. So in other words, JSON information, even though it has its origins in JavaScript, can be used in other types of applications very eloquently. Just about any other programming language that really wants to use it, very simple little routines can be written to import it if the routines don't already exist, and they probably do. All right. Um, now, one thing that, that happens when you're moving stuff like this, you know, asynchronously, is when you're moving the data back and forth, either you're gathering stuff from a form and you're sending it to the server, or you're getting it from the server and you're putting it back into the form or onto the page somehow, the, uh, it ties very eloquently to uh, this little action method that you see at the bottom. So instead of returning like a view, for example, you can return JSON. So you can grab the form data and then send it off in that format. So in other words, intelligently understands the form and intelligently packages it and sends it as JSON without a lot of uh, intervention by you, which is quite cool. All right, leveraging that a little bit. Um, it, and this is stuff that you guys are going to need to recognize as you're working with the code. Once again, we have a little uh, bit of Razor code here where we are calling upon Ajax. We're telling it that we're doing a form. And then we're setting up a bunch of options. And these options are relative to how Ajax moves the information. So which way are, are we doing a get? Are we doing a post? How are we inserting it? What happens if it works? That's the on success. Once again, read the book for, for more details. You take that and you start to, to um, take the information from JSON and display it back to the form. And you can see that we're using a bunch of different um, methods here that are built upon DOM objects. So if you have the ability on your screen to zoom in on this a little bit, it'll be a little bit easier on your eyes. But you can see that you know we set up a selector, apply it to a variable, It'll start out empty, and then we allow it to receive the information and populate. And then we just run these very simple um, uh, jQuery and JavaScript uh, commands where we're going to take the information. We're basically writing the HTML within the script. And at the same time, pulling in the data from the JSON directly through AJAX and jQuery. I know I'm going fast here. Read the book for more detail. <laughs> Um, all right, then we move on to this thing called Web API. And Web API, um, it hasn't been around all that long, but basically it kind of coincides with HTML5. As HTML5 was being developed, Web API was being developed too. It actually has its origins within the MVC architecture because the people working with MVC with the model view controller and helpers and routes and all that good stuff, um, we're able to move data around their applications, but a lot of times when data is moving, you need to use certain protocols, right? And, and, and some of the protocols that uh, are used out on the web aren't always conducive to all devices. HTTP, however, is the core, you know, web browser protocol for moving information. And wouldn't it be nice is if our applications could asynchronously talk to the server, but yet move the data through HTTP as opposed to, let's say, FTP or something other. So um, it uh, also ties into the RESTful API. And I don't know if you guys remember what that is, representational state transfer. All right, and then it's got a few different modes that it operates in. Uh, and those you should remember. Um, and if you don't remember, you should really read up on them and understand what that is. But the, the goals of a REST architecture are as follows, you know, scalability. Uh, keeping things basically generic. Um, it's 
the components that we're using are independent of um, the things within the application. So everything is built in little pieces. The separation of concerns remain firmly in place. And what what's interesting about that is because it's separations of concern, it doesn't require MVC, even though it's kind of where it came from. And it also allows you to have an MVC style architecture without MVC. All right. So now that's going to add a kind of a layer of complication because here we are, we have this way to do like kind of MVC kind of stuff without actually using MVC, but you can also use it with MVC. So it creates that, that um, flexibility and complication depending on how you look at it. Um, here I have a little bit more information on that um, where I say ASP MVC versus Web API or with Web API. Um, so MVC, as it says there, it's really good at working with, with data. It's also good at putting together pages and generating views and working with controllers and back-end code. Um, but Web API is a whole lot better at serializing data and interfacing with AJAX components. So when you try to do MVC applications that really run efficiently, you're going to find yourself very often doing a combo of Web API and MVC kind of intermixed as you have been doing and you haven't really even been aware of it for the most part. Um, it is a completely separate framework. So in other words, you can create MVC style applications using Web API, like create controllers and things like that, just with straight up uh, Web API. Uh, when you work inside the Visual Studio environment, most often you will still create folders that are called controllers and views and models uh, because that's how we've learned to organize things, but you use Web API code in its place. Um, structured data, well, think about like, a, like JSON, uh, things go in key value pairs. So I might say URL and then a colon and then a value. And then I can say name, colon, a value. That's structured data. It has a, a structure and a pattern to it. Okay. And then that structure might match up with your database or it might just be something you use to put stuff on the page. It just kind of depends. But uh, it works really, really well in those environments. And basically the fact that JSON is really kind of gain so much prominence because of its efficiency and the fact that web API works so well with it, um, it, it really kind of has become a tool of choice for many. Um, the other thing here um, are, are these two characteristics which you might find important. It's kind of redundant to have a bullet and a number, I suppose, but I guess I can fix that. Um, so in web, in web API, when you have action methods, they return models rather than action results. So that's kind of weird. And the reason they're returning models is because you're working with serialized data typically. So you're working with key value pairs being sent back and forth. So it's not going to be conducive to everything that you're doing, but it'll be conducive to very specific things, especially things that are very data intensive. And you'll really gain a lot of efficiency from it. And then everything, once again, moves over that HTTP protocol. And that's really kind of one of the important things as well, because we don't need um, other transfer mechanisms to move the information. JSON is the tool of choice. And folks, that's my brief little lecture on this, and I'm sorry for keeping you past 3 o'clock.